we go. Okay, we're going to go at warp speed. Uh, so I'm not going to click on each of these uh, links to show you what other people have done about a top 10. But everybody's got this idea of top 10. 10 most important things you need to know about Korea. And you can look at this. You're, you're going you're to get a copy of this. And you can look up each of these sites. I did do a screen capture of, uh, I think we skipped over that one. Yeah, I did a screen capture of what each of these look like. And they're the top 10 things that each of these organizations think are good. Now there's some troubles with some of these. Some of these aren't that aren't that accurate. For example, on this about.com geography, one of the things it lists uh, is uh, religion, and it says that uh, 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 thirty some percent are Buddhist, thirty some percent are Christian. That's okay, and then it says forty six percent are atheists. <laughs> And I think they're confusing, uh, not affiliated with atheists. <laughs> and there are a lot of people who are not affiliated, but they're not really atheists. So you have to be a little bit careful in some of these uh, 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 top ten lists that you look at. Here's another one uh, by a group called Blistbird. This is what it looks like. It's called the top ten misconceptions about Korea. So how if you get it wrong, and it lists ten things that you might get wrong about Korea. This is kind of useful, too. Uh, then here is an organization called Squidoo. Squidoo. I've never heard of Squid. Squid do, Squid do. Anyway, they've got a top ten list. Top ten things you may not know about Korea. This is a useful list too. Some of these lists might be helpful to you in your uh, if you're going to organize uh, uh, lots of times on Korea. Here's what that uh, page looks like. That's just a uh, screen capture. Here's another one. Top ten things you need to know about Korea. Uh, and top ten, or being customs to know before you visit Korea. And of course, kimchi is right at the top of the list here. You've got you to know about kimchi. Uh, this one is a lot of fun. Oh, I took it off at the top a little bit. Uh, but there's some blogs. This is for elementary school level teachers. Uh, is this seminar all high school? Is there anyone here that teaches elementary? Okay, you might find this list helpful. And uh, it, it comes from a blog. You can find that. Oh, here, here's a, another list of that blog. Uh, here's another thing about Korean names. Uh, sometimes you might find names a little bit puzzling because Koreans have this strategy for naming their children where there's a, the family name is given, you know, Kim, or Lee, <laughs> or Park, or Cha, or Chung. Those five names are 55% of Korea. Five names. Uh, Kim is 21% of Korea. Yeah. Okay, so uh, uh, the given name is given, uh, I mean the, the, uh, the, the, the surname is given, but of the other two names, and sometimes they only have one, sometimes there's two, usually there are two, one is a generational name. So you might be interested in, in uh, their names, and here's a, a thing on that. So that's available to you. Uh, this is an article on the $4 million teacher. Uh, how many of you make $4 million? <laughs> uh, how many of you make... Uh, $400,000. This is about a teacher who is very successful at private teaching. And in Korea, private teaching is a major thing. They have uh, what are called hagwons. The best translation would come up with is cram school. And Korean uh, children, especially in high school, go to these cram schools at night. On Friday night, instead of the football game, instead of the basketball game, where do they go? The cram school. <laughs> they go to the hardware. And um, uh, they have no social life in, in high school. You don't have a prom. You don't have uh, any of that kind of stuff. Uh, but it's all cram, cram, cram for school. And you go to school at regular hours, like from 8 to 2.30 or 3 or so. And then you go to the cram school. And uh, this man is a successful cram school teacher. And he makes $4 million. Now, that says a lot. That says an awful lot. It says that education is really highly valued in Korea. You know, that the top teacher can make $4 million. Okay. So here's an article you can read about this if you want to. Another aspect of Korean education, the emphasis on Korean education, is one of the, <laughs> this is strange, one of the strangest, one of the interesting measures of Korean educational success is there's corruption in education. There, there are payoffs to school administrators district administrators to move teachers into the wealthy school districts where they get more money from the teachers to get favors for their children. Can you imagine? 
How many of your teachers, I mean, how many of your parents have come in and tried to bribe you? Anybody had any bribe offers lately? <laughs> you have? <laughs> From whom? <laughs> A Korean family? <laughs> An Indian family? <laughs> well, you've moved into the big time. If you, if, if you get a bribe offer, you, you've made it. In Korea, at, at some levels, this is, this is sort of rampant, you know, because this education is so important. Okay. Uh, next thing I've got here, that's that article there. Uh, oh, here, I'm saying be careful, because some of these statistics, some of these reports are a little bit funny, so we're just be a little bit careful about it. So, everybody's doing a top ten list. I thought, well, I'll, get, I'll do a top ten list. So here you go, there's mine. Here's my top ten list. Can you read all that? No? All right. Number one, Korea is a beautiful place. And this is number one in my regard because I take a lot of groups to Korea. I go to Korea three times a year with the Korea Society. I take school administrators, I take school teachers. Only oh, school teachers not apply to go on the Korea Society summer uh, teaching program. And then I take, uh, I'm leaving for Korea tonight to uh, go uh, take a group of uh, textbook writers to Korea. And the, 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 the first thing that a lot of people say after they've gone out and seen the Korea, we go out to the countryside, we go to Kyungju, the old capital and all this, uh, a lot of times people say, I never realized Korea was so beautiful. It is absolutely a beautiful place. Mountainous, just beautiful place. And uh, uh, people speak English, they're getting better and better at English. They finally, finally figured out how to teach English in Korea. For a long time, I run into people that say, uh, to me, oh, you speak Korean well. I don't speak English halfway that way. And I've studied 10 years, three years in junior high school, three years in high school, four years in college. It, it, it's axiomatic. People do this all the time. And uh, they say, and I've never learned to speak English. Well, guess what? They figured out you've got to start teaching in the third grade. And now people are starting to learn English. And so they've, they've turned a corner, and English speaking is becoming... Uh, um, universities are teaching classes in English. Their whole program, Sogong University Economics Department, the whole program is in English. So they, they've turned the corner and they've realized, like European countries do, that English is the way to succeed in the world. And the food. <laughs> the food is wonderful. Uh, good and healthy Korean food. i got some pictures here. That, isn't that beautiful? That's beautiful. Uh, Koreans have this, this phrase of uh, kapsan, layers and layers of mountains. And you can see the layers and layers of mountains here. Uh, Waterfalls, happy people. Here, there, here we are with a group of uh, my study abroad students. We're over there and we have an affiliation with Kungi University. And this is my daughter right here. Isn't she gorgeous? Uh, that's, my, that's my daughter, Joy. And happy people. Uh, here we are having dinner with the uh, Korean students. And um, here's Korean food. Okay, so number one, Korea is a beautiful place. The people are beautiful, the country is beautiful, the food is beautiful. Number two, Korea is prosperous. Um, some people, David's of my age, remember when Korea was poor. And some of you who are a little older remember MASH. <laughs> There's nothing that Koreans generally hate more than the MASH depiction of Korea. And uh, MASH, is, MASH is passe now, nobody cares. There's no point hating that anymore. And the reruns are out there. Don't watch the reruns. Uh, really, MASH is about Vietnam. And during the Vietnam, it's a, it's a uh, Korean cover, but it's really about Vietnam. Uh, but Korea has lifted itself by its bootstraps. It, the economic success story of Korea is, is tremendous. Uh, the, the way they've turned from an extremely poor country. I think here recently, an economist was talking to the group, and he said, let me read you this thing. And he read this economic report. And it said, this country has no hope. Uh, it has no resources. It, it's a desperate report. There's absolutely no way that we can see where we can help this country. There was a U.S. aid report about Korea right after the Korean War. There's no way that we can help this country. This country is hopeless. And this country, Korea went from being hopeless. When I first went to Korea in 1965, 12 years after the war, still, it was the recovery from the war, and the per capita income per year was $125. I had an allowance of $90 a month. I was rich. <laughs> we were rich back in those days. Well, Korea is, is now a true economic success story, and you can see it uh, everywhere where you go. This is uh, Hangnam. There's Hangnam. We all know Hangnam style. Do you know Hangnam style is making fun of the nouveau riche? 
and the wealthy in Kangnam and their airline plan. That's what Kangnam plan is all about. But it's a very wealthy place, very successful place. Uh, number three, some of the best products in America come from Korea. And you know this. Samsung phones, LG TVs, uh, Hyundai automobiles. And they were shipped here on ships that were made in Korea because Korea is the number one ship building company uh, country in the, in the world. And we often take our groups to the Hyundai shipyard and you see these huge gantry cranes that move these parts around and make these ships. The Hyundai shipyard cranks out, I think it's a ship every other day. Wow. They have, you can see, you can see four bays there. There are four bays, two there and two there. Uh, they've got like 14 bays or something. Like that. And then some of the bays, uh, these big holes in the ground, they can build four ships at one time. You can build one super, super tanker or four regular ships in one in one thing. And then uh, you open the gate and flood the water in and, and float the ship out. It's just tremendous. Um, so Korea is a huge economic success. Korea is not a shrimp. Now that may sound stupid to you. Yeah, good it is. Uh, <laughs> but uh, Korea has had this saying that uh, when whales fight, shrimps get their back broken. What's this about? This is the depiction of Korea's sense of victimization and a sense of helplessness in the 20th century world, where they were taken over by the Japanese. As soon as the war ends, they're divided by the Russians and the Americans. And when the whales fight, when the Americans, the Russians, the Japanese, the Chinese get involved in Korean affairs, Korea, a shrimp, gets its back broken. And uh, this used to be a common expression. And uh, you don't hear that much anymore. Younger people don't see themselves as victimized because they are successful economically. And so Korea is no longer a shrimp. Uh, it's a major player in the world. If you were to pick up Korea and drop it down in Europe, <laughs> try that. There's a machine that's big enough to do that. But pick up Korea and drop it down in Europe, it would be a major European country. It's bigger than Italy, bigger than, bigger than uh, uh, Spain, bigger than France only slightly smaller than Germany and Great Britain, bigger than all of Scandinavia, uh, bigger than Poland. It, uh, uh, it would be a major player in Europe, but because of its geographic situation sandwiched between the number two economy in the world, China, and the number three economy in the world, Japan, it's, it seems like a smaller country than it is, but it really is a major uh, country. Okay, uh, number four, five. There are more Korean speakers in the world than there are native French speakers. You don't believe me, do you? <laughs> because we teach French in our high schools. And French is a major world language, and we should teach French, right? And we should teach German, and we should teach Spanish. But we're starting to catch on that we should be teaching Chinese, and we should be teaching Japanese, and we should be teaching Korean more than we should be teaching French. You don't believe me. Okay? Google it yourself. I just did <laughs> and Google it here, and here is Korean with 76 million speakers, and here is French with 74 million speakers. Okay, now you believe me? You Googled it yourself, now you believe me? Or if you don't believe that, here's another list. What's the number one speaker, number one language in the world? Chinese. It's not English, sorry to break your heart. English is number two, Spanish, go on down. And here's Korean. This list has 75 million because we lost a million on the other page. Turn the page and lost a million people. Uh, these are approximations, of course, and it counts native Korean speakers in America, in China, in Korea, as well as uh, in Japan, as well as in, as in Korea. And the French speakers are all these French colonies, you see. Uh, and still, Koreans are ahead of the French. Now, if you Google it and you get some other lists, there are some lists that has the French slightly ahead of the Koreans. <laughs> so, but the point is they're very, very close. The point is, Korean as a language is a major world language as important as French is. Now, diplomats will disagree, and the diplomats say, well, French used to be the diplomatic language of the world, etc., etc. But as far as native speakers are concerned, as far as economic power in the world, Korea is only slightly below France in, in trade and economic production, you see. So Korea is a major uh, world country. It's not a shrimp. Uh, number six, North Korea and South Korea could not be more different from one another. Uh, people get confused about this just a little bit, even in America. Now, I go, I take trips to Korea three, four, five times a year, and I tell someone I'm going to Korea. They're, oh, you're going to North Korea or South Korea? <laughs> <laughs> you don't go to North Korea, okay. <laughs> except by major effort. I notice on David's uh, uh, vitae, uh, it said he's been to North Korea five times. 
If you go to North Korea, you chronicle it. I mean, five times, that's it. You know, you've been there. Uh, each event is a major event. I've only been into Kaesong once. I haven't been into Pyongyang. Uh, I have this rule about my travel. I don't go unless somebody else pays for it. And they haven't paid for my trip to North Korea, so I ain't going uh, But I'll go sometime. But they could not be more different. South Korea is a free, democratic, capitalistic, uh, 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 successful country. North Korea is a communist, failed country. It's absolutely a failed country, and yet it, it, uh, it, it hangs on. Um, yeah, here I mentioned Korea is more democratic than the United States. <laughs> That's a rather outlandish statement, but I back it up by saying that once Korea went democratic, and it really happened through the 80s, that they got rid of the military governments, which provided an economic stimulation, but once they got into the uh, democratic period of the post 80s, uh, they really took democracy seriously. And one indication of this is universities decided to elect the university president. Now, when I mention this to American university people, well, you know, how are American university presidents selected? Board of trustees, state school, private school, doesn't matter. The board of trustees selects the president. There's no vote. But in Korea, the president of the university is elected from among the faculty. Now, that's remarkable. That's a remarkable statement of the acceptance of the concept of democracy. Some universities are backing off from that <laughs> because some professors are campaigning very early on and, and, and the favoritism system works out. So some universities are backing off from going back to having the uh, uh, board of trustees appointed. But, uh, Here's North Korea, there's South Korea and the flags up there. Uh, this is playing out very, very bitty. But what's this? What's that? What's this? South Korea, what's this? What's that? That's Pyongyang. You get a little bit of light out of Pyongyang, but uh, that says a lot. That says a lot, okay? Um, and this says a lot. This is the main street in Kaesong. And they have terrible traffic problems. <laughs> you see this person here? This person is directing traffic. <laughs> that's the, the human red light. <laughs> and um, uh, that's, that's Kesem. And here's Seoul at night. I mean, is there a difference? Do you see the difference? Have I made, have I made my point? Well, the district north of South Korea. Number seven, Korea has the best alphabet in the world. Now, how can you say that? It's the only alphabet in the world that has all five of these criteria. It's celebrated in a national holiday. What were you all doing on Wednesday? Last Wednesday. If you were Korean, you were celebrating the National Alphabet Day. October 9th is National Alphabet Day. <laughs> Isn't that great? They have an alphabet day. It's a national holiday for the alphabet. Uh, because number two is proclaimed on a certain day that we know in history, October 9th, 1446. It was developed by an individual that we know, King Sejong. How many alphabets were invented by someone that we know? Sequoia's Cherokee alphabet, St. Cyril's Cyrillic alphabet, the Russian alphabet. But uh, it doesn't fit the other criterion that we've got up here, okay? Uh, letters were created as a visual depiction of the linguistic fact of creating that sound. The K, the first letter in the alphabet, is a picture of how your tongue is looped to make the, the velar stop that is a K. The N is a picture of how the tongue touches your, your say N, N, touch your, your teeth, make an N sound, that's sort of nasal. All the sounds are based on the picture of how the sound is made. I can teach you, if you're halfway linguistic, <laughs> <it's sharp. laughs> how to read Korean in about an hour's time. Yeah. And it's not a difficult alphabet. You can learn the alphabet. Now you can read all sorts of things, you don't know what they mean, but you can read them. I teach at BYU. Okay, we're a Mormon school. Attached to the school we've got the, our missionary training center where people come in and learn languages for uh, nine weeks and then we send them out all around the world. The Korean speakers come in during the day. They get assigned to come in at two or at 10, 12, 2, and 4, they come in, they get, they're get assigned to their room, they get assigned to their roommates, and, and they settle in, and after dinner they have their first class. And in the first class they teach the alphabet. 
At the end of that first class, they sing a hymn, and everybody can sing the hymn. They don't know what it means, but you can read it. You can learn the alphabet in, in very short period of time. In fact, King Sejong had advisors that helped him with the alphabet. He had a lot of people that objected to the alphabet, believe it or not. But he had a, 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 a lot of people that helped him with the alphabet. One of them was a guy by the name of Chung Ji. And Chung Ji said, we've got this great alphabet that we've invented now. And uh, the, 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 the dullest of people can learn it in a day. And the brightest of people can learn it in the time it takes to go to the bathroom. <laughs> so uh, if you're really bright, <laughs> I guess it depends on how much time you take to the bathroom. Uh, but it's based on linguistic facts, the alphabet is. Number five, and it's an alphabet that's used by 70 million people. Or, or that just said 76 million, 75 million. Okay. So it's a useful and important alphabet. Here's what it looks like. What does it look like to you? But you, you recognize Korean script when you see it. The squares, the, the boxes, the little circles, the right angle thing. Uh, here's the K sound, and here's the N sound, and all the rest of it's the same way. The uh, T sound, is an N with air going over the top of it. This is a T sound. And, and think about it. Say not. 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 Now say really slow. Not. Notice the N where it is. Where's your, where's your tongue when you say N? N. Now say not. Your tongue's in the same place, but you use the tongue not as a nasal in N, but use it as a stop for the T. Not. So, so it, it understood. Uh, they understood. King Sejong understood the way the sounds are made. Number eight, Korean literature, Korea has world-class literature, but it's ignored in many of the literary traditions, many of the literary anthologies, many classes on world literature. Don't talk much about Korean uh, literature because Korean literature uh, during traditional time was considered a secondary game, and serious scholars wouldn't put their names on stories that they'd create. So we have a lot of authorless stories. Uh, but Korean literature is, is wonderful. Uh, there are tremendous stories, tremendous poetry. Now, uh, you all are high school uh, and grade school uh, uh, history teachers. Would any of you use literature? Do any of you know what haiku is? Yeah, you all know what haiku is. 20 years ago, when I used to talk about haiku, uh, I found that the kids in America studied haiku in high school. And then I found out they studied it in junior high school. They're teaching haiku now in the third and fourth grade. Now, as I've talked about this, our Korean friends over here have a blank look on their face, like, what the heck is haiku? <laughs> Koreans don't know what haiku is, because there's an avoidance of Japanese culture in Korea. Haiku is a three-line poem that's 575 in its rhythm pattern, and it's very similar to a Korean poem called Shijo. Shijo is a three-line poem. They're longer lines, so it looks like six lines, but it's really three lines, okay? And this three-line poem is a little bit more expansive than haiku, and it's the next step. It's the next step. Once an American student learns haiku, they ought to learn the next East Asian poetic form of Shijo. Now, I'd like you to join the movement. We need a movement of Shijo in Korea like we've had haiku. Haiku has been completely successful. You, you Korean speakers, you are educated Korean, you don't know what I'm talking about. But in America, everybody knows haiku. Well, if you know haiku, you can also do shijo. There are shijo uh, uh, contests for high school teachers. I should put this website up here, but if you, if you, if you Google shijo contest, uh, uh, it's the Sejong Cultural Society in Chicago that runs the thing. And they have Haiku uh, students write uh, uh, shijo all around the country, and uh, they have winners, and uh, it, it's really a wonderful thing. I'm hoping that shijo will become planted in American culture the way haiku has. It will be a great contribution from Korean to American culture. Here's my favorite shijo. This was written by a man who, in 1392, was asked to join a new coup to take over the government and to start a new dynasty. They did that. The dynasty was successful. This man could not join them because he was a Confucian. And if you're a Confucian, you're loyal. And you're loyal to the king. And all these other people jumped on board with this general that became the new king. But this man, Chung Wonju, could not join the coup. And when invited to join the coup, he said, though I die, though I die again, though I die a hundred deaths, after my bones have turned to dust, 
whether my soul exists or not, my red heart, forever loyal to my king, will never fade away. Is that what I've got it written up here? Did I do it with it? Okay. <laughs> that is a great poem, is it not? I did that on purpose. I did that on purpose because when I give historical presentations, I always work this poem in regarding the transition from the Koryo dynasty to the Chosun dynasty. And it always elicits the same response you just saw. Did you see that? And it was natural. You didn't do it when I did it in English, I promise you. <laughs> but when I do it in Korean, it always elicits that response. This poem, and Shijo in general, can touch a nerve. It can get to the bottom of your very soul. And literature can do that in a way that few other things can. Okay? So, uh, let me encourage you to think about Shijo. Look at Shijo. Their website's about Shijo. Send me an email. I'll talk to you about Shijo. I like Shijo. <laughs> you get the message? Pop culture. I guess we've got to talk about this. This is on, on my top ten list. Um, Y'all know Gangnam Style. Why in the world did that make me go? <laughs> it makes no sense at all. And yet the rhythm of the thing and the visual uh, uh, catchiness of the thing was just incredible. And it took off. But there are other things about uh, uh, Korean pop culture. I've got a theory. Uh, David, you're the political scientist. Tell me what you think about this. But North Korea has been isolated, loyal communists, bankrupt, their socialist economic system is failed, it isn't working, but they're holding on, you know, for the life of them. What's going to shake North Korea loose? I wonder if I'll be popular. Because these North Koreans see these videos of these cute Korean girls, <laughs> and that's just way too cool. <laughs> You know, and I think that's more attractive than than economy, because it contains economy, and yet it's 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 it captures this spirit of a person of people that that's beyond economics. I just wonder if North Korea won't fall because of South Korean power. <laughs> I mean, that, that sounds silly, doesn't it? I admit that sounds silly, but I'm serious. I, I think it might really have a huge impact on North Korea. Uh, and it's not just the songs and the dance and the pretty girls and the handsome boys. Oh, have you seen the videos? Oh, the girls are gorgeous. And the boys are handsome. I had a student, <laughs> a female student over at Kenya University last year on exchange program. And uh, I became a Facebook friend, so I monitored what she was saying to everybody. And she was leaving. She says, I'm walking across the campus for the last time. So many tasty Korean boys. <laughs> <laughs> Tasty, <laughs> she said. Uh, these kids are handsome, and uh, and it's very very popular. And it's not just the song and dance; it's the movies. Oh my goodness, the movies, the serial, the TV serials, uh, Tae Jung Goom. Uh, it's just it's just a wonderful media stuff that's going on. There they are. Whoa. Uh, there they are. That's a uh, girl's generation. Uh, this is Tae Jung Goom, the story of the. Uh, Court lady who went from cook to becoming an herbalist to uh, uh, save the, the king when he was ill. Great movies. Uh, so Korea is really with it on the media scene. And uh, finally, uh, the political area. Uh, U.S. liberated Korea from Japan, Japanese control at the end of World War II, but unfortunately participated in the dividing of Korea, and put like France. Okay, okay, okay. World War II ends. So the Allied powers look at Germany and say, you cause this war, we're going to partition Germany. And Germany is divided up into four parts. And East Germany becomes East Germany and the, uh, the Russian sector. And French, British, and American sector become West Germany, right? Germany uh, perpetrated the war. They get punished by being divided after the war. In the Pacific area, who perpetrated the war? Japan. So who are we going to partition? Who are we going to partition? Japan, they perpetrated the war, Germany, Japan, what do we do? We partition Korea. Japan's first victim of the war is re-victimized after the war. 
Now tell me where that makes any sense. MacArthur wanted to preserve his Japan. He wanted to recreate Japan, so he partitions Korea. The Russians wanted a piece of the pie. They get half of Korea. They don't get half of Japan. They don't get Hokkaido. They get half of Korea. And Korea is victimized again. You see why they were shrimp caught between the fight of the whales? You see? And it just doesn't make any sense at all. This temporary, this temporary partition has lasted 60 years. 68 years. And so uh, Korea feels victimized, and, and rightly so. And it's still partitioned. Temporarily. In geologic time, it will be temporary because it will be unified at some point. Korea will be unified at some point. But uh, it, it's hard to say when. And the United States still maintains a defense treaty with, with South Korea. And um, David's going to talk more about the political issues and such when, when he gets up there. So I'll, I'll not talk about this anymore. But here's the uh, depiction of uh, Korea and, and uh, the United States. Now, uh, this is what I had prepared for y'all. But uh, they. My host last night, Jane and Rosa, implied that uh, that they want you want to know a little bit about this thing that I gave at, at Ohio State. It's a thing called New Perspectives on Korea. I'm going to, to ten, right? Yes. I got I got ten minutes. How am I doing? Yeah. 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 Cool. Thank you. Thank you. We got this thing on turbo charge. We're going to go even faster now. So don't unfasten your seatbelt yet. We've got to go even faster. This presentation, I can only give you a little bit of it. Uh, what it is is two parts that uh, I, I first ask the audience, and this is for a Korean audience, I ask the audience to tell me what the highlights of Korean history are, what are the major factors of Korean history. And what usually comes up is this list, that uh, Korean history is full of turmoil, chaos, invasions, shrimp among whales, Korean history of victimization, the Chosun dynasty lasted too long, was corrupt and stagnant, and because of Confucianization, because of Confucianism, <coughs> Korea was lost. Meaning, because of the conservative Confucians who were not ready to adjust to the modern age in the 19, uh, early 1900s, late 1800s, because of this, Japan came in and took them over. This is a list of, of uh, things that most people say are a good summary, a good summation of what Korean history is about. <laughs> My point is it's all false. These are all wrong. I have a completely different perspective on Korean history. Now my Korean friends over here, they're like, well, I don't believe this. This is, this is, this is kimchi. This is the real thing. <laughs> uh, but I argue that it's really a matter of perspective, and these things are quite different. If you take a longer view of Korean history, if you get away from the 20th century, that's the problem. The problem is the 20th century. If you get away from the 20th century, none of these things are true. They're all true for the 20th century, but they're not for other things. Uh, the problem is a problem of orthodoxy, and, and Korea, in its educational system, focuses too much on the exam, and the answer has to be on a bubble sheet. It has to be A, B, C, or D. So how long is Korean history? You can't discuss it. It has to be, it's 5,000 years old. That's the, that's the correct answer, 5,000 years old. It's absolutely false. Korean history is not 5,000 years old. <laughs> My Korean friends are really Shock look on the <laughs> if you look at it from an archaeological point of view, Korean history is 10,000 years old or 240,000 years old, depending on looking at Paleolithic, Mesolithic, uh, Neolithic age factors. But if you talk about history as history, what does history mean? It means you write something down, right? If you don't, if you don't have it written down, it's prehistoric. Written history in Korea is less than 2,000 years old, more like 1,500, 1,600. Uh, so, but the, we have these constructs that are that are built in, and, and we have the same thing in America. We have this perspective that American history is very short, right? How old is American history? 226 years old this year, right? Uh, I graduated from Harvard University. Harvard University is 396 years old. <laughs> How did I go to a school that's twice as old as the country, <laughs> right? So you have to go back beyond what we, we have this concept that American history is short. We ignore the full colonial period, and we ignore the pre-colonial period, the American Indian period. So from that perspective, American history is 5,000 years old. 
you know, archaeologically you can find evidence of men in Korea for in, in America for longer than that. So there's this perspective that I, I, like, I like to challenge and, and look at it differently. Um, I, I do this by introducing uh, a couple of things. This is a book I wrote about uh, Korean Confucianization. And I look at the 17th century changes that took place in, in Korea. And these changes were remarkable. Daughters were disinherited. Uh, sons, uh, the eldest son becomes primary. And there's all sorts of things. Come on, come on. Uh, but we don't have time to talk about all of this. But uh, just to say that uh, in this Confucianization process, Daughters were disinherited, sons, the eldest son becomes primary, daughters no longer participate in, in ancestor ceremonies, they used to do them in rotation, they no longer do that. Marriage patterns change where it becomes patrilineal, where they no longer marry men and women going out as, as, as convenience dictates, but now daughters move in and the boys stay at home. This becomes a patrilineal, classic patrilineal system. And this is only as old as the, 18, as the 1660s. So this true Confucianization is, very, is fairly recent. Well, if that's the case, well, these are some of the changes that took place. If that's the case, then what does it say about the big picture? And I don't have time to develop this for you, but uh, uh, the point I make here is that if there was tremendous dynamics in the 17th century, if Korea was able to adopt and change, then the Chosun dynasty is no longer the stagnant place that most Koreans say it was. It was rather a dynamic place. And what was the name of the video, which, the video clip we showed at the beginning, the propaganda piece you all saw? <laughs> it, was, it was full bore propaganda, but it was telling the truth. If, you, if you've done it, you've done it, okay? Korea is a dynamic place. It was dynamic in the 17th century as well. And uh, this is the period that I work on. And then I say, well, if it was dynamic during the 17th century, what about the whole range of, of Korean history? And I look at several factors in Korean history, such as the long dynasties. Korea has long dynasties. You all are world history experts, right? <laughs> Name me a dynasty that lasted more than 300 years. Name one. Chinese, what one? Han, okay. Han went 400 years, but it was 200 and then fell and then 200 more. So it's really two 200 year dynasties back to back, but it was 400 years, not 500. Okay, so name me another dynasty that lasts more than 300 years or 500 years. Okay, some people say the Ottoman Empire, but that was in two phases too. Some people talk about the Russian dynasty that lasted a long time. You can find isolated cases. But Chinese dynasties, as a rule, lasted 250 years. Japanese shogunate, as a rule, lasted 250 years. Korean dynasties, the Chosun dynasty lasted 518 years. The Koryo dynasty lasted 476 years. Two 500-year dynasties back to back. Before that, the Shila dynasty, unified Shila was 270 years. But if you go back to the Three Kingdoms Shila, it goes 1,000 years. Korea has, if this were Olympics, if we had the history Olympics, they would have gold medals or silver and bronze for long-lasting dynasties. This says a lot. This says that Korea is stable. One other factor, look at the transition from dynasty to dynasty. In Korea, it was remarkably smooth. The Koryo dynasty was a protectorate of the Shila dynasty when Shila fell, and then turned into Koryo. The Koryo dynasty, when it fell and the, and the Chosun dynasty took, dynasty took over, Yi sung the general that took over, the one that killed Chung Hong Ju, though I die and die again, he, uh, when he took over, uh, he was sent to go up to China and fight the Ming dynasty that had just come in. And it was a suicide mission. He knew it. He said, this is crazy. I'm going to go back and take over the court. He came back in, and he took over the court in an afternoon. In one afternoon. The number of people dead, you could, you could number on one hand or two, maybe a few other soldiers. Dynasties don't change that way in other places. Between dynasties in China, between shogunate and Japan, you have wholesale bloodshed for a generation or two. But not in Korea. And the elite structure has basically remained intact. What are the dominant surnames in Korea? Kim, E, Pak, Che, Chung. They're all Sheila names. Sheila and Kaya. Half of the Kims are Kaya. But when Sheila took over Kaya, they absorbed Kaya. They didn't go in and destroy them. They absorbed Kaya. So half of the Korean Kims are Kaya Kims. 
who was the unification general that conquered Pekje and Kogyo? The Shila general who conquered Pekje and Kogyo. If you don't know this, uh, we're going too fast maybe. But there was a general in Shila that conquered Pekje and Kogyo and unified Korea for the first time. That general was named Kim Yushin. He was the grandson of the last Kaya general. This Kaya general becomes absorbed into the leadership structure of the Shila dynasty. Not only was he the general, his sister married the king. And so this absorption of rival powers and smooth transitions speaks a completely different Korea than the chaos, turmoil, all of this sort of stuff. One other point, can I have two more minutes? <laughs> One other point is the multiple invasion factor. Koreans like to talk about how many invasions they've suffered. And I ran into, into a man who had tabulated, he'd gone through the history and he tabulated out. There were 9,432 invasions he had all count. Now that gets to be ridiculous. If you're counting that many invasions, you're counting every pirate raid along the coast. <laughs> you know, if a Japanese pirate comes in with a bunch of, uh, with a ship and steals a pig and a bag of rice, and kidnaps a pretty girl and runs off, that's not an invasion, that's a pirate raid. And the same thing on the northern border. In this argument, I argue, uh, I, I put up the question, how many invasions were there? I don't have time to do it. I ask the question, how many invasions were there? Were there 9,000? Were there 900? Were there 90? Were there nine? My answer is there were only two. There were only two invasions. This shocks our Korean audience. Because when the Mongols invaded, they killed over a million people. When the Japanese invaded, Mongols in the 13th century, Japanese in, in 1592, they killed about 4 million people. Those were invasions. Everything else pales by comparison. Now, Korean uh, students of history know that the Mongols, uh, that the Manchus invaded just after the Japanese. The Manchus invaded Korea before they went in to, and set up the Qing Dynasty in China. Okay? When the Manchus came in, they went in, they demanded the surrender of the king, and then they left. That's a very different thing from what the Mongols and the Japanese did. The Mongols and the Japanese went through the countryside raping, pillaging, and burning. When the Japanese invaded in 1592, they burned almost everything that could be burned. If you can find a pre imjin that's our phrase for that war, if you can find a pre imjin piece of paper or building, it's a rare thing because everything was burned. The Japanese just went through the countryside and burned everything. When the Manchus came in, they demanded the surrender of the king because they were going into China, and then they left. That's a very different thing. That's a very different thing. So uh, my argument is if you're going to call these other two, these first two big things invasions, you've got to have a different word for the other thing. All right, all right, they're invasions. But they were not on the same scale. They were not the same thing. And, and the idea of the 20th century victimization, because Korea was victimized in the 20th century, they cast that view back on all of Korean history, and they make Korean history look like it's one bundle of turmoil, chaos, and invasion. And it was not. Rather, it was a strong, peaceful, stable society, unlike the modern depiction that, that many people have of, of Korean history. And to, to summarize this, uh, I, can, I can jump ahead to one slide here, and that is, I, I took a group of uh, scholars to Korea, and we were standing in front of these tombs. And one of the scholars was an archaeologist. He worked in Egypt and the Middle East. And he said, when were these tombs robbed? He assumed they were. When were these tombs robbed? I was standing next to Ijo Mook, who's a prominent Shila historian from Sogak University. I said, these tombs haven't been robbed. And he said, no, these tombs haven't been robbed. And the archaeologist said, well, of course they've been robbed. In Egypt, in the Middle East, they robbed the tomb before the dynasty's over. Why did Willie Sutton rob banks? That's where the money is. Where's the gold? You know what's in here. You've got to rob the tomb. That's where the money is. It's like robbing the bank. That's what you do. No one robbed the, the tombs in Korea. And this archaeologist said to me, I'd given him my theory of Korean stable society, Korean peaceful history. And he said, well, that reinforces your argument, doesn't it? And I go, duh, I hadn't even thought of that. But yeah, there was never enough chaos in Korea to rob the tombs. So this says a lot about the stability of Korean history. Well, that's the other talk. That's the Ohio State talk. I gave you the, the, the 15 minutes. It deserves three hours. But that's about it. Okay, that, that's it. Uh, do you have any questions? Okay, I convinced you. Okay, thank you. <laughs>
Thank you.